Here comes the Son, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We now begin a line-by-line, in-depth study of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we can uh, find what can rightly be called a summary of the entire Bible. It's one of the greatest books ever written, and it's written especially for people living in the last days of human history. It's the apocalypse, the unveiling, the uncovering, the full manifestation and presentation of what God and our Lord Jesus Christ are really like. Let's begin with the first verse. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which, which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling, the manifestation and presentation of Jesus. This is the one true purpose of all scripture, to reveal, to uncover, and to show us the character of God. And our Lord Jesus has always been the active agent through which God's revelation has been made. When Christ was on this earth, he said in John chapter 5, verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And our Lord Jesus was referring to the Old Testament scriptures because the New Testament was still in the process of being written. Our Lord Jesus pointed back to the Old Testament scriptures as the place where he was especially revealed. And this should help us to understand that the Old Testament scriptures are the foundation for the new covenant that was to come. John says this, he says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. It was God the Father who gave the revelation to Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus has always been the active agent through which God's revelation has been made. The Apostle Paul says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Well, Jesus is the active agent of revelation to all of mankind. He's the creator. And the scripture says that he made the universe. It's by him that we receive any revelation. And 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, And to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. This text says that the source of all is the Holy Father, of whom are all things. And the active agent through which all is accomplished is Jesus, by whom are all things, and we by him. Jesus is the active agent in the creation of this world. He's the creator. And we all know that he's the active agent in the salvation of the human race. John says that the book of Revelation was given by Jesus to his servants. The revelation is given especially to his servants. That's the church. Now, the Greek word here in this first verse is doulos. And it means a servant or a slave. It's used twice in this first verse. The apostle John is called a slave of Jesus in the same way that Isaiah, Job, and all the prophets are slaves or servants of Jesus. Second, all Christians are here called slaves or servants of Jesus. As Ephesians chapter 6 verse 6 says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The revelation of Jesus is given to the one who obeys Jesus, who is willing to do his will and obey him with his heart. God allows his truth to shine through those who are faithful and have kept the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. That's the church. And throughout history, the Lord has chosen to work through his servants or his church, his people. When the apostle Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, he asked, Lord, what will thou have me to do? That's Acts chapter 9 and verse 6. He was placed in connection with a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Acts chapter 9 verse 10. The Savior placed the inquiring Jew in connection with his church, 
there to obtain a knowledge of God's will concerning him. Now, the Lord has always worked through his servants, his people. In the Old Testament, the plan of salvation was delivered to the nation of Israel. As John chapter 4, verse 22 says, You worship you not not what we know, what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now truly the Lord was seeking in those days to reach the entire world with the gospel by way of the nation of Israel, the Jews. The Jews were his servants, his slaves, to take the good news to the entire world. But we know that they utterly failed in that mission. John chapter 1 verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own, what? Received him not. And the Jewish people did not receive him, because they would gathered a false idea as to the manner of his coming. This Jesus, they said, a peasant and a carpenter of obscure origin, the Son of God, it couldn't be, they thought. Well, the Jewish people overlooked those scriptures that pointed to the humiliation of Christ at his first advent, and misapplied those that spoke of the glory of the second coming. It was pride that obscured their vision, and they interpreted the prophecies in accordance with their selfish desires. Truly, the Bible says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. And today God still works through His servants, the church, His people. They're described later in the book of Revelation, Revelation 12 or 17. It says of them that they are they which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But God still has a people today through whom He is seeking to, to reach all mankind and through whom the good news will be taken to the entire world. They're called the remnant, who by God's grace keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, God's people will always be on the edge of expanding truth. Proverbs, Proverbs 4.18 says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. Now, as we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament Scriptures, Revelation, is full of truth that we need to understand. Now, Satan has blinded the minds of many people so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the book of Revelation their study. But Christ, through his servant John, has here declared what shall be in the last days. And he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. That's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. As Mark chapter 4 verse 22 says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. The book of Revelation, friends, is intended to be understood. It's not a mysterious book, but it's intended to be understood in these last days. And the Lord sends His messages to all mankind by sending it through His servants, the prophets, and then through the agency of His angel, whose name is Gabriel. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. It's encouraging that God will do nothing but that He will reveal it through His servants the prophets. God wants us to, to keep informed and know exactly what He's about to do. And He does this through His servants the prophets. But, but God sends that message to the prophets through Jesus, who gives it to the angel of prophecy named Gabriel. Notice what it says in, in the book of Daniel. Now God uses the angel of prophecy to give the message to Daniel. Daniel 9, 12, 21 says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And in Daniel 10, verse 21, Gabriel is speaking. He says, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Now, the Prince of Peace, of course, is Jesus, referred to as Michael here. Only Gabriel and Michael deal with the Scripture of Truth, the Bible. There are only two that deal or reveal the things of God. That's Gabriel and Michael. It's not anybody else. 
It's just those two. Gabriel, the angel of prophecy, and the Lord Jesus himself, because he's the source of all revelation. Now we can be assured that, that all revelations come through them. Not Moses, not Isaiah, Jeremiah, or any of the prophets, living or dead. There are only two that are used for revealing God to God's people what shall come to pass in these last days. That's Gabriel and Michael, the Lord Jesus Christ. Gabriel and the Lord Jesus. Gabriel is the angel of prophecy, and he stands right in the presence of God to receive all truth so that he can convey it to mankind. It was Gabriel that came to Zacharias to reveal to him the good news of Jesus, the servant, the servant of mankind. Notice what Luke chapter 1 verse 19 says. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Well, it was Gabriel. The angel next in rank to the, to the Son of God, who came with the divine message to Daniel. It was Gabriel, his angel, whom Christ sent to open the future to, to the beloved John and to the prophet Daniel. And what a blessing is pronounced on those who read and hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written there. And that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Now, Gabriel is the angel of prophecy. And it's he who comes to Daniel to give skill and understanding into the mysteries of God. And he comes to the apostle John as well. The book of Revelation says that this message came through the angel Gabriel, his angel. And now it's given unto his servant John. First God the Father gives the message, then the Lord Jesus receives it, who then gives it to his angel, Gabriel. And then the Apostle John is given the, the revelation, who gives it to the church. There's a chain of command here, and there's a chain of command, friends, in heaven. And it's seen clearly here at the beginning of the book of Revelation. But this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the case of John, Christ himself came from heaven and told him what to write. There are some messages so important that Jesus our Lord delivers them. The book of Revelation is one of them. The entire book of Revelation is for us in these last days. And Jesus came to speak to the Apostle John and give him this revelation. But why was the Apostle John chosen to, to reveal uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ? Well, I believe it's because he was great in privilege, he was great in zeal, and great in responsibility. And he was obeying the Word of God. John, it was thought, would live until the coming of Christ again in power and glory. He'd be the one who would survive until the coming of Christ again. John 21, verses 21 and 22 says, Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Now we're to follow Jesus, whatever may happen to anyone else in God's church. It was the Apostle John whom the Lord loved very much. And he'd received the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 19, verse 26, When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. What a privilege the Lord gave to John to take care of his own mother. Now, truly, Jesus loved the Apostle John. And when the Lord was crucified and the disciples heard of the resurrection, it was the Apostle John who outran even Peter to the tomb. Notice John 20, verses 3 and 4. It says, Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, that's John, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. Well, John outran Peter. He was younger, and he came first to the sepulchre. Yes, John was younger than Peter, but John also had a more zealous and a, and a pure faith. He wanted to be there first. And he was there first at the tomb. John was the apostle chosen to pen 
the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2 of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1 verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. It was John who bore a testimony or a witness of the word of God. Now the Greek word for record is martudeo, our word for martyr. One by one the disciples had perished. One by one the disciples had fallen as witnesses to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. They'd fallen as martyrs. John the Baptist was beheaded. Christ himself was scourged in prison and crucified. Matthew was killed by a halberd. That's an axe on the end of a spear. James the last was stoned and his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Matthias was stoned at Jerusalem and then beheaded. Andrew crucified at Edesia. Mark was dragged to pieces by an infuriated mob on the streets of Alexandria. We know that Peter was crucified head downward at his own request. Paul was beheaded in, in Rome by order of Nero. Jude, the brother of James and also called Thaddeus, was crucified at Edesia. Bartholomew was beaten and crucified. Friends, all of the disciples bore record of the Word of God by their lives. Hebrews 11:32 through 40 says of the heroes of faith, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Japhthari, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, obtained the promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured and not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, that's Isaiah, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. These people stood up for Jesus, friends. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Praise the Lord. The Apostle John can be considered a martyr too. He was sentenced to die. But by the grace of God, he was delivered from a martyr's death by a miracle from God. Domitian, the Roman emperor, not being able to put him to death, banished him to the island of Patmos to labor in the mines in the year A.D. 73. John was recalled by the emperor Nerva, however, who succeeded Domitian, and was regarded a martyr on account of his having undergone a cruel execution, though it did not take effect. Although the enemy tried to boil him in oil, the Apostle John was not killed. John was nearly 100 years old at the time of his death, and he died of natural causes among his brethren and his fellow believers. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, Thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. John declared, My master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I'm a weak and sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 
Now, these words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very man who had cast him in. That's Acts of the Apostles 570. In these last days, friends, some of us may have to suffer a trying experience in the great conflict which is soon to come, the mark of the beast test. But our Lord Jesus has promised us as, as He will be our deliverer. Luke 21, 21 through 16 says, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Some of you. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess you your souls. Now John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the word of God for the Apostle John had a dynamic power and energy. The prophet Jeremiah says of God's word in Jeremiah 23 verse 29, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Well, John believed that the Word of God could do something. In the Hebrew language, there is a dynamic energy in any word, but most of all, in the Word of God. And although John wrote the revelation in the Greek language, he thought in the Hebrew. For him, the Word of God was a unit of energy charged with power. It was fearfully alive because John knew he knew the one who had promised to fulfill that word. As there is a full tree in the seed of an acorn, so the word of God has within it the seed of its eventual fulfillment. As surely as the oak, the full tree, is in the acorn, so surely is the gift of God in his promise. God does not lie and he'll fulfill his word. God's word springs forth and will not return unto him void. We don't even need to look for the outward evidence of the blessing. If God said it, it's so. He'll perform his word just when he said he would. The seed, the Bible says, in Luke chapter 8 verse 11, is the word of God. God's Word moves and accomplishes what the Lord wants. It's fearfully alive. It moves upon the mighty waters. It can stop rain from falling. It can, it can bring water out of a rock. It moves hearts, peoples, and nations. Friends, we haven't seen anything yet. When the Holy Spirit falls with, with ten times the power, you and I are going to be on the ground because God is here. The Word of God is active, alive. It moves upon the entire face of the earth. And the Word is the only weapon used by the conquering Christ in the book of Revelation. The Word is the sword that issues out of His mouth. Psalm 33 verses 6 through 9 says of the Word, By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap, he layeth up the depth in storehouses. It was God, it was the Lord Jesus Christ who gathered up the waters there in Moses' day, gathered them up and froze them with his breath. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Is it any wonder that Satan wants us to study and view anything other than God's holy word? God's word has power, and it will accomplish its objective. And so we should worship the Word. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness 
comprehendeth it not. That's John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. As Amos chapter 5, verse 8 says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark, that's the dark day, with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Friends, when the dark day comes, the waters of the earth, of the oceans, are going to come roaring in on the dark day. That's Amos chapter 5, verse 8. And the Apostle John connects very closely the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ as well. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, according to Revelation 19, verse 10. The Bible says in Revelation 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto men, to me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. Don't worship angels. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, the testimony of Jesus is the empowering by God to be his mouthpiece or his prophet. And the spirit of prophecy is the lesser light, which always leads us to the greater light. That's the Bible. Now, the prophecies of a true prophet never contradict the scriptures. The, true, the two agree. What is given today will be in complete agreement with what was given in the past. As 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit, there must always be a similarity in the visions now given with those described in the Bible. The two agree. That's why we must check the prophets with the Word of God. And the Apostle John had the spirit of prophecy. He was God's mouthpiece to speak to the generation of his day, as well as those living in the last days of human history. The Apostle John, friends, speaks to us today. And it must be remembered that God does not always speak through dreams and visions. Now, Jesus was the greatest prophet of all, yet he never had dreams and visions. But his source of inspiration was the Holy Spirit, who led him step by step by the Word of God and by God's providence. Even John the Baptist, whom, whom Jesus said was one of the greatest of all prophets, never worked a miracle. His total reliance, friends, was on the Word of God. And wouldn't it be wonderful if all of God's people were prophets? We can be. If we are close to the Holy Spirit, obey the Holy Spirit, and follow the Word of God. This is what Moses desired in Numbers 11, verse 29. He said there, Numbers 11, 29, Would that God that all the Lord's people were prophets. And that the Lord would give him his spirit upon them. Well, the gift of prophecy. It's one of the most important gifts given to any of God's people. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, Follow after charity, that's love. And desire spiritual gifts, yes. But rather, that you may prophesy. And in these last days, we are not to despise the spirit of prophecy. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 19 through 21. The Bible says, Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold that fast which is good. And the Bible says that the Apostle John bear record of the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. Now let's go to verse 3 of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1, beginning there with verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now this is the first of seven blessings located in the book of Revelation. The Greek word for blessed is markarios, or happy. It's the same word used by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what the other six blessings in the book of Revelation say. Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. 
Revelation 16:15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Revelation 19:9, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 22, 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And finally, Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Friends, there's a blessing in doing the commandments of God. The blessing comes, first of all, if we read the book of Revelation. One is blessed if he reads the prophecies of Revelation. That's what we're doing. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 says, And the Lord answered, and s answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. Now there's a blessing in reading the book of Revelation for ourselves, because then we can claim a personal knowledge of what the Lord is saying. The reading that is being spoken of here is one that acts upon what is read. It's an active reading of the book, not simply a reading to obtain facts. Our faith must be, friends, a personal faith. We must obey the Lord. We must appropriate it for ourselves in order that, that we, if we're not to do any good, we'll do it by the grace of God. In the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, the only reason five are wise and five are foolish is because five of the virgins had no oil of their own. Instead of searching for themselves, uh, they depended on others to do the searching for them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Matthew 25, 4 says, The grace of God was not with the foolish virgins. They had no oil in their vessels. They were not doers of the word of God. You see, character is not transferable. No man can receive the Holy Spirit for another person. We must read the book of Revelation, friends, for ourselves. If we're to receive the, the first blessing promised. As our Lord Jesus says in Matthew 25, 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. We must read for ourselves if, if we're to receive the first blessing of the book of Revelation. We're blessed or happy if we hear the words of the book of Revelation as well. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing, what? The word of God. It's important to, to hear the book of Revelation in order to receive the blessing. As Ecclesiastes 7 5 says, It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Now we've got to spend time with the word of God. There's so much uh, to distract us in this world, and we take so little time to hear the Word of God. Instead, we choose to listen to the song of fools. And then many times we hear the Word of God and do nothing about it. Now, there's a great truth in what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 12, verse 2. Son of man, the Bible says, Thou dwellest in the midst of, re of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not, they have ears to hear, and they hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Friends, our ears must be unstopped by the Holy Spirit in order to recognize truth, born on the sound waves and on the Internet. Mark chapter 4, verse 23 gives us the following admonition. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you met, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. If We are blessed if we hear the words of the book of Revelation, friends. We're blessed or happy also if we keep the sayings of the book of Revelation. A person does not actually believe something 
unless he's keeping those things that he says he believes. To do otherwise is to be a hypocrite. Actions reveal principles and motives and will not act out what we do not believe. We receive a blessing from the book of Revelation only if we keep the instruction that the Lord is seeking to give us. It's highly important that we study the book of Revelation with, a thought in, with this thought in mind that we're going to do what it says and, and what it teaches. To do otherwise is to follow the example of unbelief of the Jewish people in the time of Christ. They heard, but they did not understand. They saw indeed, but they did not practice what they saw. That's Isaiah 6.9. Their condition was one of spiritual death, even though they appeared alive. As John chapter 12, verse 37 says, But though he had done so much miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Imagine, the Lord of glory, all the miracles that he performed, and yet they did not believe the Master, the Messiah. Blessed or happy, Luke 11:28 says, are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Zechariah 3 7 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among those that stand by. Those are the angels. Who are those that stand by? They're the angels of God that are sent to minister to those who shall be, shall be heirs of salvation. Psalm 25.10 says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. Psalm 37.34 says, Wait on the Lord and keep His way, and He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. And finally, 1 Corinthians 15.2 says, By which also you are saved, if... You keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Friends, it's important to keep the Word of God. It's not God that puts the blinder before the eyes of men, or makes their hearts hard. It's the light which God sends to His people to correct their errors, to lead them in safe paths, but which they refuse to accept. It is this that blinds their minds and hardens their hearts. They choose to turn from the light, to stubbornly walk in sparks of their own kindling. And the Lord positively declares that they shall lie down in sorrow. When one ray of light which the Lord sends is not acknowledged, there is a partial benumbing of the spiritual perceptions, and the second revealing of light is less clearly discerned. And so the darkness will constantly increase until it is night to the soul. Christ says, How great is that darkness! That's taken from Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, 1021, 1890. Friends, it's important that we, we read, hear, and keep those things which are written in the book of Revelation because the time for these prophecies is here. It's right now. It's, we are in the end time, and Jesus will soon be here. This last phase, the, for the time is at hand, illustrates an important principle of Bible study, and it's that when the prophecies or visions are given to the prophet, that is when they begin. The prophecies of Revelation began in the lifetime of the prophet John. The time is at hand, he said. Not was at hand, not will be at hand, but is at hand. This tells us that Revelation is not a sealed book, but it's intended to be understood because the time for its fulfillment, friends, is at hand. Let's go to verse 4 of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1 verse 4 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which, wa which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now the book of Revelation is addressed to the seven churches. Now, these churches actually existed in Asia Minor and were seven literal churches. But the revelation is also addressed to the church in general, to God's people from the time of the Apostle John to the second coming of Jesus. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time and cover the history of the church in different periods in the history of the world. The messages given to the churches in Asia 
portray the state of things existing in the churches of the religious world today. The names of the churches are symbolic of the church, Christian church in different periods of the Christian era. The number of the churches, seven, indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the, the messages extend to the end of time and are in force today, while the figures used are symbolic of the state of God's professed people the wheat developing among the tares, truth standing on its own eternal basis in contrast with error. The, the salutation, the seal of the, the Godhead is included in this section. Here the Apostle combines the, the Christian concept of grace, unmerited favor, with the Jewish peace or shalom. Grace expresses God's love and mercy which he shows toward people who don't deserve it, while peace is the result of God's gracious act. And grace and peace come first from the Father. He's described as Him which is and which was and which is to come. This expression indicates that the Father is the one which is, indicating present existence, and the one which was, signifying past existence, and the one which is to come, indicating future existence. The Holy Spirit is also described here as well as the seven spirits which are before His throne. Additionally, the Lord Jesus Christ is described in a beautiful sevenfold way here in verse 5. The Godhead, the three in one, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit give their salutation, friends, at the very beginning of the book of Revelation. The Holy Father, from Him which is and which, which is to come, that's Revelation 1.4, the Holy Spirit, and from the seven spirits which are before His throne, that's Revelation 1-4, and the Holy Son, and from Jesus Christ, Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. We're speaking of the Godhead, friends, in this section. The concept of the three in one is found in other portions of the Scriptures as well. Notice what First Peter 1-2 says in describing the three in one. Peter says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. There we have the three in one. And Acts chapter 2, verse 32 and 33 says, This Jesus hath God received up, or raised up, wherefore we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having as ye are called in one hope of the calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and you all. Now clearly the Bible uh, supports the concept of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three constitute the person we call God. Uh, this portion of the text also speaks of the Holy Spirit as a member of the Godhead. He's described as the seven spirits which are before his throne. The number seven, as I've mentioned, indicates completeness, completeness and perfect fulfillment, perfect fullness, and is used symbolically here. There's only one Holy Spirit. According to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, where well, the Bible says, For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. Again, Ephesians 4, 4, the scripture says there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. But in Isaiah 11 verse 2 we have a better idea of what the Bible means when it says seven spirits. Isaiah 11 verse 2 describes seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says there, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of two, wisdom, three, Understanding the spirit of four, counsel, five, might, and the spirit six of knowledge, and of seven, the spirit of the Lord. In Revelation 4 5, the Bible compares the seven spirits to the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. In other words, the seven spirits may be compared to the candlestick, which is located in the first apartment of the sanctuary, displaying the spirit of the Lord, the counsel, his might, his understanding and knowledge, his wisdom, and the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, friends, is a member of the Godhead and is mentioned here 
at the very beginning of the book of Revelation. It's important to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person, not merely an influence. He has a personality with a mind and a knowledge and a will. Now Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit by using the pronoun He, He, indicating that He considered the Holy Spirit a person. Notice what John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He'll guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. He shall show you things to come. That's the Holy Spirit. Friends, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, when we're obeying the Lord, He, the Holy Spirit, comes to us and shows us things to come. Now the essence of personality is having a mind which has knowledge and a will. It's not essential in order to have personality to have a body. In fact, some people, when they are older, when they are older may have a body, but they lose their powers of thinking. That kind of person may die as a non-person. An essential for personality, friends, is a mind which has knowledge and a will. It can be seen from the Bible that the Holy Spirit has all three. He has a mind. Romans 8 verse 27 says, And he that searcheth the, the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In the same way that Jesus makes intercession, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit has knowledge as well. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And finally, the Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11 says, But all these worketh the one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severely as he will. Now we see that the Holy Spirit is a person as much as God the Father is a person, as much as our Lord Jesus Christ is a person and has personality. As a person, the Holy Spirit plays a vital role, friends, in the direction of God's work against Satan and his evil angels. And the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead and is referred to as God in the book of Acts. Notice what Acts chapter 5 verse 3 and 4 says. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thy heart uh, to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thy own? And after it was sold, was it not thy own power? Why hast thou conceived the thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so there we have, friends, the seal of the eternal three as we begin the study of the book of Revelation. All three, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, are represented here at the very beginning of Revelation because each one plays a vital role in the salvation of mankind. Let's look at verse 5 of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. As we look at verse 5 of Revelation chapter 1, we see Jesus our Lord described in a beautiful sevenfold way. He's first of all the one who is the faithful witness. Now, Jesus is, first of all, described as the faithful witness or martyr. And in dying for the human race, Jesus was the faithful sacrifice. Daniel 9.26 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now, Jesus came to die for the human race, not for himself. Acts chapter 2, verse 23 says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now Jesus was nailed on a cross by the hands of godless men and women, and then put to death so that we might have eternal life. He's the faithful witness, friends, the one who gave his life to save the human race. Second, Jesus is the first begotten or born of the dead. Now the Greek 
translates this phrase, the firstborn of the dead. Protos is the Greek word which means first of several. And so by reason of his resurrection from the dead, Jesus was the first of several to proclaim light and power and knowledge to the people. Jesus is not, o not the only one resurrected on that first day of the week. Matthew 27, verse 52 and 53 says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto them. Now imagine all these saints of God going into Jerusalem and witnessing that Jesus is the real Messiah, and that we should believe on him, Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. All resurrection depends on him. Jesus has the preeminence. His resurrection is the most important. Colossians 1 verse 8 says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The word begotten as used here in the Revelation means that the resurrection of Jesus is the most precious and the most important, not merely the, the first in time. The word is used again in Hebrews 11:17, where the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Now chronologically, Ishmael was first. Isaac, however, was most precious. Now Isaac here is called the only begotten son. But we know that in Abraham's family, Ishmael was the first chronologically. Isaac, however, was the most precious in that family because he was the, the son of promise. Now, Jesus, our Lord, is the first begotten of the dead. His resurrection makes all the difference in the world and is the most precious. Without his resurrection, we would be lost forever and could not be resurrected. The Lord is the first begotten or born of the dead. Third, Jesus is described as the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, Jesus is the chief prince of the kings of the earth. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21 says, Which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, Jesus, our Lord, is a chief prince in the entire universe, friends, for he is rightfully Savior of mankind, of the universe. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now Jesus is the Prince of the Kings of the Earth. Daniel 18.25 describes uh, the Lord as a Prince of Princes. Jesus is far above any prince or earthly ruler here on this earth or anywhere in the universe. Daniel 9.25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Now everywhere you read, the Lord Jesus is called the Prince, the Great Prince in Daniel 12, verse 1, the Prince of Peace. He's called the Prince of Life in Acts chapter 3, verse 15. Surely his name is exalted, far above any name given to anyone in the whole realm of this world. Finally, Acts 5, 31 says, him hath God exalted in his own right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Friends, Jesus truly is the prince of the kings of the earth, and soon he'll reign on earth and in heaven forever and forever. Now the fourth description of Jesus is that he's the one that has loved us. Actions speak louder than words. Jesus' love was demonstrated for us, and, and what he did, he was, his was an unselfish love, and it was freely given to us while we were yet his enemies. Friends, only love awakens love, and this is why we love him. Remember that. When you are got out of dispute with your, with your loved one, 
remember, remember that only love awakens love. First John four ten says, "Herein is love, not that, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins." And how touching it is in that verse found in the book of John, John thirteen verse one, the Bible says this. Now before before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them, what? Unto the end. Friends, the Lord will love us all the way to the end. That's the kind of love that we need, isn't it? Jesus' love is the kind of love that will love all the way to the end. John 15, 9 says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. John 13 verse 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Everything that Jesus did, friends, was an act of love. And the him that loved us is the fourth description of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. This is the fifth designation of our Lord, the great sacrifice of God's dear Son on the cross of Calvary, was necessary for the salvation of mankind. Hebrews 9.22 says, and Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now Jesus washed us from our sins in His own blood. He died in our place, and now we can be forgiven. One solitary life born in an obscure village of a peasant woman, one solitary life working as a carpenter and as a preacher, and this one solitary life became obedient unto death. He loved us and He washed us from our sins in His own blood. And now we can be victorious over sins because of what Jesus did. He loved us. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Friends, that coqui that you hear in the background is a, a frog here in Puerto Rico that lives only in Puerto Rico. And he's my friend and he's helping me preach the sermon. <laughs> because of Jesus' sacrifice, friends, we are different. Because of his love for us and for the creation, we are different. We've been washed. We've been sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus. And that means that we can have victory over sin and belong to that group which will make it to heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? I do. We must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father, the Bible says. This is the sixth designation of Jesus. This is in the present tense. We are now by faith kings and priests. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Israel. John 1.49 says, Nathaniel and Nathaniel Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And as the King of Israel, the Lord makes us kings and priests. In 1 Peter 2, 9, the Bible says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a royal people. And Revelation 5, verse 10 says, And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That time is coming, friends. That time is coming when we shall be kings and priests under the Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the seventh designation. The word glory is doxa in the Greek. Matthew 25 verse 31 tells us that when the kingdom of glory is to make its appearance, Jesus will be there. Matthew 25 verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. When Jesus finishes his mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary, when he, when he comes to each name, then the kingdom of glory comes. The Lord is coming very soon, friends. Daniel 7.14 says, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and tongues should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. The word dominion is associated with rule and authority, and friends, and Jesus is coming very soon to establish that dominion and authority. 
Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now the Bible says that the Lord's coming will be a public, visible event. He comes with clouds, the Bible says. Once he came in weakness, now he comes in power. Once he came in humility, now he comes in glory. The Lord Jesus comes in the same way that he ascended up into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken, and behold, a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Those are angels. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye going into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him going to heaven. Now when the Lord ascended up into heaven from the outskirts of Jerusalem, the Bible says that a cloud received him out of their sight. And these two men or angels spoke with the watching disciples. The cloud which escorted Jesus into the heavens was a cloud of angels. When the Lord returns, friends, a second time, he'll come again and he'll be escorted by thousands and thousands of angels. Matthew 26, 64 says, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And Isaiah 66, 15 tells us that when our Lord Jesus returns, he'll come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. Psalm 68, 17 tells us that the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai in the holy place. Psalm 104, 3 compares the clouds with his chariot. The Bible says, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot. So we can see that when the Lord comes a second time, the entire sky will be filled with thousands and thousands of heavenly angels who will escort the King of Glory to planet Earth. Finally, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so sh shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, when our Lord returns to this planet, He'll be escorted by thousands and thousands of angels. And the entire sky will appear like clouds upon clouds and thousands of cloudy angels. The Apostle John says, Behold, he comes with clouds. The book, The Tsar of Ages, page 832, says this about the Lord's ascension into heaven. It says, Christ had ascended to heaven in the form of humanity. The disciples had beheld the, the cloud receive him. The same Jesus who had walked and talked and prayed with them, who had broken bread with them, who had been with them in their boats on the lake, and who had that very day toiled with them, up the ascent of all of it, the same Jesus had now gone to share his father's throne. And the angels had assured them that the very one whom they had seen go up into heaven would come again as he had sent it. He will come with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Does the Bible teach that when Jesus comes again, every eye that has ever lived will see him come in clouds of glory? Friends, I believe that this is the teaching of Scripture. The Apostle John describes a resurrection at the second coming. He says in John 5, 28 and 29, he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation, or condemnation. Friends, when Jesus comes, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Ellen White says this, Between the first and second advent of Christ, a wonderful contrast will be seen. No human language can portray the scenes of the second coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. He is to come with his own glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. He will come clad in the robe of light which he has borne from the days of eternity. Angels will accompany him. Ten thousand times ten thousands will escort him on his way. The sound of a trumpet will be heard, calling the sleeping dead from the grave. And all that are in the graves, all that are in the graves, shall come forth. 
and before him shall be gathered all nations. The very one who died for man is to judge him in the very last day. For the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Friends, what a day that will be! What a day that will be when those who rejected Christ will look upon him whom their sins have pierced. They will then know that he proffered them all heaven if they would but stand by his side as obedient children. That he paid an infinite price for their redemption, but they would not accept freedom from the galling slavery of sin. They chose to stand under the black banner of rebellion to the close of mercy's hour. That's Review and Herald 9 5 1899. Friends, when Jesus comes, all will be raised. Even those who reject the Christ will look upon him whom they pierced. What a day that will be! All will meet their judge in that day, for the Father hath committed all judgment to the Lord Jesus. Again, the prophet Daniel speaks of the resurrection in which all will have a part. Daniel 12, verse 12 and 13 says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the, to the thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in the lot at the end of the days. Friends, the end of this world is being spoken of here by the prophet Daniel. We're very close to the very end of this world's history. The 1,335 day prophecy takes us right to the very end, when the end will be, and when the prophet Daniel will then stand in his lot and be judged with the entire world. Ellen White, the prophetess to the remnant, says, More than 1,800 years have elapsed since he who spoke as never man spoke, and could utter only truth, declared, The hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. The trump of God has not yet sounded. That voice so full of power uh, has not yet penetrated the sepulchres. That hour so full of promise to the people of God has not yet arrived, but it must come. It's not far in the future. And then she says, Some of us will doubtless be living when the voice that is heard everywhere, even to ocean depths and the sinless caverns of earth, shall be heard, echoing from sea to sea, from valleys and from mountains, calling to life the sleeping dead. There will be a reappearance of every human being that has gone into the grave, the aged who sank under the hand of death, with the burden of years upon them, mankind in its prime, youth in the early bloom of life, and the little child. And then Ellen White says, she says, All shall awake and shake off the fetters of the tomb, but not all shall awake to everlasting life. Friends, that teaches that when the wicked, the wicked are to be raised as well when Jesus comes. Notice what Jude fourteen sixteen says. It's also speaking of the second coming of Christ. The Bible says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. A Jew says that when Jesus comes, he's coming in judgment, in judgment upon all, both the righteous and the wicked. Is the word of God too hard to understand? I don't believe it is. This text is speaking of the second coming. Jesus is coming to convince all of their ungodly de deeds, and this is the second coming. Our Bible text is worth more than one Bible text is worth more than ten thousand of men's ideas. I stand by the word of God. All means all. There will be a reappearance of every human being that has gone into the grave. All will be summoned to the judgment which occurs at the second coming. The day of Christ's coming will be a day of judgment upon the world. When the multitude of the lost, those whom God has favored with great light, but who reject the light, those who might have been saved, but had they obeyed God's law, but who refused to obey, 
when these see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, they'll understand the great sacrifice made in their behalf. They'll understand the unmeasured love of the Redeemer, His incarnation, the sweat drops of blood, the marks of the nails in His hands and His feet, the pierced side, and they'll be they'll ask to be hidden from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They'll see as in reality the, the condemnation of Christ, and they hear the Christ the cry, release unto us Barabbas. They'll, they'll hear the question, what shall I do with Jesus? And the answer will say, crucify him, crucify him. Friends, every eye is going to see the King of Glory when he comes. There'll be a reappearance of every human being that has, ever, that has ever gone into the grave. Speaking of the judgment, our Lord himself says in Luke 11, 31, the Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus says that the queen of the south, whom he considered righteous, would rise up in the judgment against the wicked generation of his own day. Consequently, the righteous and the wicked would be there. It's at the second coming, friends, that our Lord comes in his glory, glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead. Paul says in Second. Timothy 4 1 and the Lord Jesus who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom it's at the second coming that everything will be done and it's not in secret and the Lord will shout from the rooftops everything will be made known in that day of final judgment again the Lord says in verse 32 of Luke 11 the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for if they repented at the preaching of Jonas behold a greater than Jonas is here Jesus considered the men of Nineveh righteous but those of his generation the Lord considered unrighteous because the men of Nineveh would rise up in the judgment to condemn them again Jesus is giving us a, a picture of the soon coming judgment he says that both the righteous and the wicked will be there together. Friends, every knee will bow when Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. At his second coming, the scene will be changed. He will be acknowledged by all as the King of glory. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The angels will bow in adoration before him. His enemies will see the mistake they've made and every tongue will confess his divinity. Praise the Lord. Jesus is coming back. This is the revelation of, that we need in these last days, friends. We need to see the unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to walk with that stranger who walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We need to break the living bread of life with him as they did. Abide with us, the disciples asked him. Abide with us. That's Luke 24 and verse 29. And as he did, they noticed his words. As, as, they, as they spent time with him, they noticed his words, his manners, his wounded hands. And they exclaimed, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures? That's Luke twenty four thirty two. Friends, their hearts burned within them as they saw a clearer manifestation of the character of God. They saw the revelation of Jesus Christ. Adam saw the revelation of Jesus Christ and he called him the seed of the woman that would come to bruise the serpent's head. Abraham knew him as Melchizedek, king of Salem. That's Genesis 14 verse 18. Jacob called him Shiloh of the tribe of Judah. Isaiah called him Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, that's Isaiah 7, 14 and 9, 6. Jeremiah claimed to be the branch of David, the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, verse 6. The prophet Daniel called him the Messiah. John the Baptist declared him to be the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And finally, our Lord Jesus himself, when he walked this earth, the Prince of the Powers of Darkness, Satan himself acknowledged him when he said, I know thee whom thou art, the Holy One of God. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 24. Friends, as we study the book of Revelation, we need to see the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Just like all the faithful in the Bible, we need to behold His character, see His loveliness, and then be changed by the Holy Spirit into His glorious image. That's my prayer. What a wonderful person our Lord Jesus Christ is. This is the revelation that each of us needs to, to see. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you.